If you'll look inside your bulletin and pull out the sermon notes that you find there, all of our scriptures are right there written for you today on your sermon notes, so you can follow along there. So for this Christmas season, we're going to take a look at the sermon series entitled, How Can I Afford Christmas This Year? Now, you know as well as I do that uh, for a variety of reasons, <clears throat> the supply chain has been a little troublesome this year. There are things not on the shelves that we normally would expect. inspect. So uh, when you go to Walmart or Home Depot or wherever, or Target, wherever you like to shop, there are things that are just missing. We can't get a hold of them. And I don't know if you have heard this or not, but there are two companies that have decided to do something about that and help, uh, especially for the Christmas season, do something about the supply chain. So Federal Express and UPS, two companies that we rely on heavily to get our Christmas packages, they have decided to merge as one company. Have y'all heard this? They've decided to merge as one company in order to get the supply chain back up and running and things delivered faster, even faster than Amazon Prime, they're thinking. So they have now a new name for the new company. It's called Fed Up. <laughs> now, that's an old joke. That's not true, but I do love that joke. You know, because of your personal situation, uh, you may be wondering, how can I afford Christmas this year? Amazon Prime may not even be anywhere near your list, and you just can't afford that. So I present this sermon series to you as an encouragement that Christmas is not about money. Christmas is about Christ. It is about His celebration and the celebration of His birth. So it's time to celebrate the birth of Christ as well as anticipate His second coming as we do. The Christ Mass, M-A-S-S, -S, as it was originally called, it means the Holy Day of Christ, the Christ Mass. And some believe and state that it was around 350 A.D. when Pope Julius I declared that the birth of Christ would be celebrated on December 25. And we've been doing that ever since. But during that time, around 350 A.D., they had a Roman pagan holiday uh, around a, during the Christmas, during the uh, winter time and December time. So Pope Julius the first wanted Christians to have something to celebrate that was holy, that was completely different from that Roman pagan holiday, and so he initiated Christmas. But I wonder. Today, if Pope Julius was here, <laughs> would he think that we've reverted back to the pagan holiday, <laughs> or are we actually celebrating the birth of Christ? So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be taking a look at how can we can afford Christmas and what the Bible teaches us about Christmas. We're going to look at three specific topics, and I've listed them here. First of all, how to pay for Christmas. We'll look at that today. Next week, we'll look at giving, gifts that we can actually give. And then finally, part three, receiving, which was what we really love, God's gift to us, God's gift to me. I've picked out a memory verse for this. You're very familiar with it, Luke 2, 11. This is the good news of great joy. So let's say this verse together. Will you say it with me? Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord, Luke 2, 11. So hopefully you know that verse. We'll talk more about it in today's sermon. But I want to share with you today three specific ways that you can pay for Christmas. And none of them include borrowing money from me. So I don't have it to give. Look at with me at number one. Here's the first way we can pay for Christmas this year. It is to plan my Christmas according to love. I need to plan my Christmas according to love. There are two basic ideas here. The first one is we need a financial plan for Christmas. Most people don't have that. You have to have a financial plan for Christmas. And secondly, your plan needs to be based upon love. 
And where do I get this from? Well, I get it from Jesus Christ. The very first Christmas, the birth of Jesus, it came about because God planned it, and he planned it based on love. And so we need to follow that same model as we celebrate the birth of Christ. Going back to our memory verse here, let's talk, look at it again. Luke 2, 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This great announcement was the fulfillment of God's planning. It was the fulfillment of the long-awaited Messiah. It was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. The promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, had finally come to earth. However, these prophecies that we find in the Old Testament about Jesus, they were not just ideas that men had and wrote down. They were not just concepts or words. They were the very communication of God himself about the future and how he would bring Jesus Christ to save humans from their sin. And now, the time had come for God to fulfill this specific promise. Imagine the angels in heaven waiting for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years for this to happen. They're waiting because they want to go and announce it. They're waiting because they want to rejoice that Jesus has finally come to the earth to save mankind from their sins. They had known about the prophecies as God had given it to uh, mankind and to the Israelites and to the prophets. They knew about that. They're waiting, they're waiting, they're anticipating. And right now they're waiting for his second coming just like you and I are. And finally the day came. God sent Jesus to the earth. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He's Christ the Lord. And God said, okay, okay, angels, go. You can announce it. And they came with this great news of great joy and announced it to the shepherds near Bethlehem. What joy the, sh the angels must have even had in finally being able to come to earth and announce this good news of great joy. John 3.16 tells us about God's plan and his plan based on love. For God so loved who? The world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this one scripture, like the one we read a minute ago, talks about God's plan. Jesus himself is talking here in this passage. He's the fulfillment of God's plan. And it is based on love. It is a plan to send Jesus into the world to save mankind from his sins. And God's motivation for doing that was love. God had a plan and it was based on love. One more scripture to look at concerning God's plan. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Ephesians 4, verses 5 and 4 and excuse me, Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. I know where it is, I just have trouble saying it. Even before he made the world, God what? Loved us. There's his love. And he chose us in Christ. There's his plan to be holy. And without fault, in his eyes, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. This scripture takes us back to a time when time didn't even exist. It is a time when God came up with this plan based on love. It says, even before he made the world. God loved us. He chose us. Before God made the world, there was no such thing as 24 hours in a day. So we cannot look at our calendar and say, God made this plan on such and such a date at such and such a time. It didn't happen that way. It happened before he created the world. God chose to love us. And he knew that we would sin even before he created us, before he created the world. And he chose to love us. He chose to adopt us, to make us holy and without fault. And he did that with this plan of sending Jesus into the world to save us from our sins. His plan happened at that time that you and I can't even imagine. 
I don't know exactly when God sat down and did this, but he did. God demands punishment for sin, and Jesus was his answer for that. Jesus did come. He came as the perfect sacrifice for sin. And he says, this is what God wanted to do. He gave him great pleasure. He did this because of love. So God had a plan for the first Christmas, and he planned it at a time when time didn't even exist. And his plan was based on his love for you and for me. I want to tell you a story about a pastor I had when I was a little boy. His name was Harold Cushing. Harold and his wife had a plan every Christmas. And he always talked about that plan at Christmas time. And his plan at Christmas time, he and his wife, they decided that they would give as much to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering as they spent on all the Christmas presents every Christmas. He did that every Christmas. Whatever they spent on Christmas presents, they gave also as a Lottie Moon offering. That took a lot of planning. And the reason Harold and Ann did that was because they loved missionaries. They really did. Later in life, their firstborn daughter, Charlotte, became one of our Southern Baptist missionaries along with her husband. They've since retired and now live in Montgomery, Alabama. Also later in life, Harold and Ann, because of their love of missionaries, they became part of the board of the International Mission Board. They were the ones helping to decide who to send out as missionaries. Every candidate as a Southern Baptist missionary has to go before our International Mission Board, a group of people. And they got to be present on that board choosing our missionaries. But I was always amazed that Harold and Ann did that. Every Christmas, they would set aside all year long enough money for Christmas presents and to give the Delighted Moon Christmas offering And those two amounts were exactly the same. So the question for you is, do you have a Christmas plan? And if you do, is it based on love? Again, I don't think most people in America have any type of financial plan for Christmas. And it certainly isn't motivated by love. Usually it's just motivated by how much I can impress people (laughs) with what I give them. And that's how we operate. And that just puts us deeper into debt. But again, Christmas is not about money, it is about Christ, the Christ Mass, the Holy Day of Christ. I challenge you, it may be too late, but I challenge you this Christmas to come up with a Christmas plan that is according to the love of God within your heart. Now next Sunday, again, we're going to talk about specific gifts that we can give. But for today, I emphasize to you to plan your Christmas Plan it according to love. Now look at a second idea of how we can pay for Christmas. Number two, take responsibility for debts. Now, if you're already having trouble paying off your credit card, then buying more Christmas gifts with money you don't have is only going to cause more problems for you and your family. It's only going to make matters worse. Most people live by the idea, well, I can pay for this when? Later. I can pay for it later. But if you can't afford it today, you're not going to afford it later either. We need to stop that mindset based on what the Scripture tells us. It's, uh, excuse me, Romans 13, Romans 13, 8. It says this. Pay all your debts except the debt of what? Love. There's that word love again. Pay all your debts except the debt of love for others. Never finish paying that. For if you love them, you will be obeying all of God's laws, fulfilling all of his requirements. So a couple instructions here. First, pay your debts. It's very simple. We don't need uh, a great theological explanation of that. We know what that means. Pay your debts. And in order to pay your debts, you have to stop going into debt, right? We understand that. We can't do both at the same time. So if you owe someone money, or if you owe a business money, you need to do everything you can as a Christian to honor God to pay off that debt. And if you're having trouble paying that person or paying that company or business, then give them a call and say, 
can I get on some type of payment plan? I want to pay this off. Be honest with them. If, you're, if you have credit card debt that you cannot afford, or you've maxed out your credit cards, then cut them up. You know, get rid of them. If, if you're having trouble with credit card debt, then maybe you don't need a credit card. If you don't know how to control your spending, you certainly don't need a credit card. So cut them up and then call the credit card company. If you don't call them, they're gonna call, call, they'll come looking for you, right? Call them and say, could you please lower the interest? I want to pay this off. I know most credit companies are willing to work with people, but you have to take the initiative and call them. Pay your debts, it says. Second instruction here is to never finish paying the debt of love to others. Why? Because loving others, it says, fulfills all of God's laws, all of God's requirements. So looking at these two instructions in the same sentence reminds me of the words of God, you cannot love God and money at the same time. Excuse me, Jesus said that. You cannot lo love God and money at the same time. Why? Because either <laughs> we pay our debts or we become a slave to money. If we're paying our debts, we're showing love to other people. We're demonstrating respect and love to those we owe money when we pay our debts. But if we can't pay our debts and we're a slave to money, then we're not showing love to other people. I want to tell you a story about my family, and I may have mentioned this before, but in 1997, my wife and I and my two daughters had been called to New Jersey to move there and pastor a church in Bridgewater, New Jersey. It's a big move for us. We'd never been really up north or lived up there, but we got ready to move, and I, I quickly found out that it was a little expensive to live in New Jersey, <laughs> more so than in South Carolina where we were moving from. So we looked for a house. We finally found a house we could afford. And in the process of getting approved for that new house and the mortgage, it was discovered on our credit report that there was $25,000 in credit card debt on our credit report. I thought, where did that come from? And so we began checking into it. My wife and I had one credit card. And we paid it off every month. We didn't have any uh, rotating debt. We always paid that off. The only debt we had was the mortgage. And so we looked into it, and I finally figured out someone had committed credit card fraud against me for five credit cards, each for $5,000, and they'd maxed them out and were not paying on any of them. Then I found out it was a relative of mine who did that. They had gotten a hold of my name and my social security number and went into debt for $25,000 with credit card fraud. So I had to call the companies myself and cancel those credit cards as fraudulent. And then I had to confront my relative with their sin against me. And that was hard to do, but I did it. They finally apologized. And it took a while then for all of that uh, debt in my name to disappear. But I was not accountable for it because it was fraud. You see, when we, pay, when we fail to pay our debts, we not only hurt self, who else do we hurt? Other people around us. Because we're not loving them as we should. When we fail to pay our debts, debts we get enslaved to the debt, and we no longer even realize how to love other people. So what is our responsibility? The scripture says there, as we read it in Romans 13, our responsibility is to pay our debts, which includes money and the debt of love. Pay off your debts and always pay the debt of love. The debt of money and the debt of love are both responsibilities that we have to other people. So yes, plan your Christmas. Have that financial plan and let it be according to love. And then pay your debts. Pay them off so you're not enslaved to money and never, ever finish paying the debt of love to other people. Now, a third way, we'll finish up with this one. The third way we can pay for Christmas is resist greed. And this goes along with the debts, but it's a saying from Jesus. We have learned that uh, in the past, they've, they've calmed it down a little bit in recent years, but in the past, Black Friday has been known to kill people from being stampeded trying to get into a store. That's happened, hasn't it? People have been 
stepped on and killed because of the greed that we have of wanting to be the first into the store and get those Black Friday bargains. Look at what Jesus says in Luke 12, 15. He says to the crowd, don't be greedy. Why? Because owning a lot of things won't make your life safe. Now, Jesus gave this instruction in the context of a parable that we call the parable of the rich fool. But Christmas has become a time when retail stores depend upon our greed. <laughs> the advertising is based upon our greed and our desire of wanting more and more and more. And so when we fall for that advertising and we give in to the greed, we end up buying things that we don't need, thinking our life will be so much better. But then when Christmas is over and all the bills come due, then we realize what a fool we have been. So Jesus tells us very clearly, don't be greedy. Why? Because owning all those things will not make your life any better. It will not make your life safer. In fact, just the opposite happens. Greed brings trouble to self. It brings trouble to our family. And yes, as I pointed out a minute ago, it can even cause the death of other people, as we have seen on some Black Fridays. I have two stories I want to tell you about greed. To me, they're, they're funny, but yet they're also sad. And I may have shared one of these with you before, but years ago, um, it was Thanksgiving, and my wife and three children, we went to Birmingham, Alabama to be with my wife's parents for Thanksgiving Day. They had just moved and downsized their life to a new house in a new neighborhood. And as you have seen right around Flowery Branch, when they're putting up new neighborhoods, there are some houses that are built, and then you've got all these empty lots. And sometimes the empty lots have huge mounds of dirt piled on them where they've been excavating. And they pile up the dirt on the different empty lots until they need it. Well, that was the case in my in-laws' new neighborhood. Their house was probably the 20th one built in the neighborhood. And on the empty lots were huge mounds of dirt. After we had our Thanksgiving lunch, my son Murray and I went outside it was a beautiful day, and there were some little boys playing hide-and-seek in the neighborhood. And, of course, those huge mounds of dirt, that, those are great, great playgrounds for little boys, right? And it made a great place for them to hide. So Murray and I are standing there watching this game of hide-and-seek, and one boy's counting, and the other boys are running to different lots and hiding behind houses and hiding behind the mounds of dirt. And all of a sudden, one little boy who was right across the street from us, hiding behind one of these mounds of dirt, his cell phone went off. <laughs> and it was ringing. I could hear it. And the little boy playing it, he heard it too. And of course, that little boy was the first one found in the game of hide and seek. And as I thought about that, I said, why does a 10-year-old boy need a cell phone? Why? And I hear parents today complaining about their children spending too much time on their cell phone. And I want to say, who bought it for them? We need to resist greed. Greed has become so popular in America that little children can't even enjoy a game of hide and seek anymore without a cell phone. The second story about greed involves a church I was working in years ago in Virginia. This was early on at the church, and one day I, I answered the phone. It was somebody in need of help, and we got a lot of calls at that particular church. We were a large church in the community, and so we got all the benevolence calls first, usually, than the, than the other churches. But this lady started telling me a long story about the trouble she was in, and the trouble was that her landline had been cut off, she hadn't been paying her phone bill, and she couldn't pay it, and now there would be an extra fee to get it turned back on. And she wanted to know if the church would pay all of her bills up through the phone bill and then ha pay to have it turned back on, which would have been quite a lot of money. Now, that particular church I served in, they had agreed in the past, and I followed along with, they agreed to help people with rent or mortgage. They agreed to help people with electricity 
with food and with medicine, those types of things, or heating oil. That was a big one there in Virginia. But they had also agreed that they would never pay for anyone's phone bill. They didn't feel like phone bills were enough of an emergency to pay for other people in the community. Now, I started to tell that lady that, but I'm a curious person. So I asked her, before telling her we couldn't help her, I said, ma'am, if your landline has been cut off, how are you calling me now? She said, I'm using my cell phone. And so then that aggravated me, and I told her, ma'am, I have a full-time job as a pastor. My wife has a full-time job as a professor. And even with both of our incomes, we, neither one of us have cell phones. And we didn't. We didn't have them at that time. And I was totally amazed that she was complaining about her landline being cut off while still having a cell phone. It just didn't make sense. It is not your responsibility. It is not your responsibility to make sure that retail companies make a profit at Christmas time. That is not your responsibility. Your responsibility and my responsibility is to be obedient to Jesus Christ. And what does he say? Don't be greedy. That's it. Now, if you have money and you've planned for your Christmas and you want to show love to people, then by all means, get them something they need. Christmas is a great time for the bargains on Black Friday. We know that. But you don't have to go into debt to do that. And you don't have to be greedy to do that. Plan your Christmas according to love. Pay your debts. And then show love to people without being greedy at Christmas time. Don't be greedy. We need to overcome the idea that owning a bunch of stuff is going to make us better in life. It doesn't. We need to overcome the lie of advertising, which helps us then to resist the greed in our heart. My invitation to you today is this. As we looked at these scriptures, the invitation is be responsible to pay for your Christmas. And we've looked at some great scriptures of how to do that. We know that the Christmas season is not about Christ. I'm, I'm sorry. It's not about money. It's about Christ. And therefore, we need to make sure we are responsible to pay for our Christmas. My wife and I have been married for 34 years. This is our 35th year. There have been some years when God has blessed us with good incomes, and we've been able to plan for our Christmas. We've been able to buy some wonderful presents for our children and even our parents. But there's been other years when we did not have large incomes. Either one or both of us didn't have any income sometime. And so in recent years, we have learned that it's not about how many gifts you can buy, but it's about being with family. It's about celebrating Christ. There have been several years when we just didn't have any money set aside for anything. We just didn't make enough. And so we would pass the hat around, and we would draw names out of the hat in our own family of five. And that meant that we bought one gift for one person in the family, and that was it. And even then, we had to make some of those gifts. I remember my children making gifts for us, and we would make gifts for them because that's all we could afford at the time. But again, Christmas isn't about money. It's about Christ. And today, do you know Christ? I ask you that. Do you know Christ? Is he living in your heart? If not, I offer you the opportunity right now to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. That's the best Christmas gift you'll ever receive. We'll talk more about that in a few weeks. But for today, be responsible to pay for your Christmas. Let's pray about that decision. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for the gift of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And if there's anyone here today that doesn't know him as Savior, would you help them at this moment to have enough faith to repent of their sin and ask Jesus to come into their life? Thank you, Jesus, for loving us enough to come to this earth to save us from our sin. 
And thank you that this time of the year we can celebrate the birth of Jesus. We can celebrate your love to us. Forgive us, Father, for being greedy. Forgive us for not paying off our debts. Forgive us for not loving others. And help us this Christmas to be responsible, to pay for our Christmas in a way that honors you. We make this our commitment, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.